so I'd like to welcome Professor Tarunab Khaitan uh, to this online interaction. Uh, he has visited Nalsar a few years ago. Uh, we ended up doing an informal interaction in our academic block when all the classrooms were shut. <laughs> so I think, uh, and, and I think a couple of years ago also, again, you did an online interaction with us uh, and spoke about one of your papers on executive aggrandizement, uh, which we in fact used as a required reading in our uh, separation of powers course uh, last year. So uh, we do teach uh, the introductory courses on Indian constitutional law in the third year. And the uh, LLM students take a course on comparative public law uh, in the in the second semester. So both of those courses do happen. In the the course on separation of powers and the course on comparative public law for the LLMs generally happen in the January to April term. And I found that this paper would definitely speak to many of the themes uh, that we cover in those two courses. Uh, this term we do have an introductory course on fundamental rights, uh, which is happening with the year three students. And the master students have a course, uh, which is introduction to legal theory. So I think those students will continue with us into the next term, where the content of this paper uh, is going to be directly relevant. A couple of things about uh, about Tarunab. Uh, I think most of you have heard about him or read about him, uh, but uh, he also happened to be my senior at NLS. And I must especially mention that uh, when I was a first year undergraduate student, uh, he was the first teaching assistant we had. Uh, for our introductory course on sociology of law, and and we felt that uh, he was very engaging and introduced us to a lot of concepts, uh, which I don't think we would have otherwise got in a systematic way uh, at that early stage. So I think I'd be over special debt to him for being a very active teaching assistant way back in 2003, uh, and of course now he of course has a storied academic career, uh, so I don't want to embarrass him by <laughs> going through his formal credentials. So let's get straight to the paper. Uh, as I see it, it is a contribution in the field of uh, comparative constitutional law uh, and to some extent constitutional theory. And uh, for me, the immediate sort of point of comparison uh, is an older article by uh, Professor Bruce Ackerman uh, called The New Separation of Powers that was published 21 years ago and in fact is now a staple reading uh, in different parts of the world. In fact, when I exchange notes with friends in other countries uh, who are doing courses on comparative government or comparative politics, uh, they also end up using that paper, uh, even if the structure of government in their country is not necessarily of the kind uh, which Professor Ackerman's paper covers. So as I read the paper by Tarunath on moderated parliamentarianism, uh, I thought that one of the threads in the paper was to try and refine and improve upon uh, the idea of constrained parliamentarianism uh, framed by Professor Ackerman, which has been very influential and shaped the discussion uh, in this area now for a couple of decades. But just to give a sense of the central argument, because uh, we did request all student uh, students to read the paper in advance, but just in case uh, I see a couple of students who are from the younger batches as well. So let me just quickly go through the main line of argumentation, and then I have a few questions for Tarunab. Uh, hopefully, which he can engage with once we complete our round of responses. So, as I see it, uh, his introduction clearly says that this paper attempts to connect threads from the field of constitutional law and political science. And in particular, he begins with the observation that generally in the field of constitutional law, we tend to focus on discussions around separation of powers by looking at the executive legislature connection, uh, which is how Professor Ackerman had framed his discussion on separation of powers two decades ago. And the political science literature, which tends to be more empirical, uh, more, more data based, tends to focus more on the working of political parties and electoral systems. So, Tarnav in, in a way suggests that there is a clear epistemic division of the disciplines uh, which we now need to work through and, and perhaps make more, of, more of a conscious effort to integrate doctrinal analysis in constitutional law with empirical findings in, in political science. Uh, and I think that's definitely a relevant uh, concern for us. Uh, because especially when we engage with different themes in Indian constitutional law, I think that's more of an approach that we need to internalize uh, if we really have to produce scholarship that is rooted in our context. Uh, otherwise, what tends to happen is that if we engage narrowly in doctrinal analysis, the tendency is to cite the existing sources, and the existing sources tend to be produced in other parts of the world, which don't really reflect uh, the empirical realities of politics in India. So I would really say that for students of Indian constitutional law, it's very important to draw that connection between the claim of empirical political science and uh, doctrinal uh, studies in constitutional law. So Tarunov is working with three different layers of analysis. 
Uh, one is in the constitutional frame, he's talking about the, the interbranch uh, relationships in terms of how we conceptualize strong presidential forms of government, semi parliamentary forms of government, and classical parliamentary forms of government. And there are certain qualitative attributes which we give to each of these forms of government, which may be present to a higher degree in one, but not so much in the other. For example, when I do the LLM course on comparative public law, we actually use Professor Ackerman's reading as one of the main framing readings, because I think he does a good job of surveying and comparing how parliamentary systems have evolved and developed in different parts of the world. But of course, he makes a very sharp sort of binary comparison between presidential and parliamentarianism. And I think Karuna is, of course, just keeping track with the literature and saying that that's not necessarily the best way of serving the various forms of government that we have uh, if we look at the executive legislator connection. So I think he begins the paper by just clarifying that while presidential forms of government or strong presidential forms of government have their own advantages in terms of leaders which uh, reflect popular consensus or popular support at a given point in time, in some contexts, uh, elected executive might reflect the value of electoral accountability. In some cases, it might reflect the value of decisiveness. And on the other hand, the opposite of that tends to be a diffused parliamentary system where it is felt that electoral representation through an elected parliament and the primacy of parliament is a more organic way of ensuring democratic representation. So both have their merits and pitfalls. And Tarunav essentially is framing his argument in the middle somewhere by working upon the existing literature on semi-president uh, parliamentarianism. I beg your pardon. So semi-parliamentarianism, as he explains in the middle of his paper, uh, is more of a term to describe systems where you might have, in fact, an elected executive, such as an elected president, who gets elected through popular elections. And you might also have a strong executive that is accountable to parliament directly, such as a, a prime minister who needs the support of the majority in the parliament. So there are several nations in the world where you have such a model where actually executive power tends to be divided between two branches uh, in this form, where you might have a direct election for a presidential office and, of course, a prime minister and a cabinet which is responsible to parliament. So for those of us who are conditioned to think about uh, the Indian parliamentary structure as the norm, it is a bit of an oddity if we are not aware of this. So I think it's important for us to keep a sense of how parliamentary government may also mean different things uh, in different parts of the world. Now, Professor Ackerman had drawn a sharp distinction between US-style presidentialism and the other major parliamentary democracies of the world, where, of course, he was thinking about the broader legitimating principles of government. So he was thinking about the idea of democratic legitimacy and how it is reflected in the working of parliamentary and presidential systems. Then he had a, a significant section on professional expertise and impartiality. And I'm going to ask Taruna why he hasn't engaged with that uh, particular idea too much in this paper. And of course, he talks about the protection of fundamental rights, which is largely the domain of the courts and other independent offices. So Tarunab's argument is slightly different from uh, Professor Ackerman's argument, because rather than uh, working within the frame of constrained parliamentarianism, where the elected authority of the legislature is reflected in the executive in a cabinet, and then the power of both the executive and the legislature is constrained by a network of fourth branch institutions, such as regulators, integrity offices, and courts, Tarunav, in a way, is not speaking so much in this paper about the role of courts or fourth branch institutions. And I personally felt that, uh, at least for the general audience, it wasn't so clear why uh, he was not emphasizing so much on these counter majoritarian institutions. But I'll, I'll ask a specific question about it. But at least in terms of how the argument is framed, it seems to be a discussion about searching for a more balanced approach towards uh, parliamentary forms of government. So then the other two relevant units of analysis are the assumptions of what a constitution should do with respect to a political party. Uh, the paper sets out these purposes in four forms. Uh, they say that political parties reduce uh, transaction costs for voters and the state because political parties are essentially uh, performing both public and private functions. Uh, political parties historically uh, had their origins as private associations because they were representing organized economic interests in the English parliament. But over time, we can see that political parties have this Janus face character, as Taruna points out, where they will both be attributes of private corporate forms and public responsibilities, which evolve with the development of political parties and their embodiment in the state system. So there is a section where he talks about the four major benefits of having political parties uh, in terms of reducing costs of participation by creating forums for participation, channels for participation, for voters to put across their view to people in government 
and also for the government to correct uh, the, the varied opinions in society. Then, of course, information costs in terms of how political parties through their organizational structure convey relevant information in both directions, which he calls the bidirectionality quality of political parties. And then he, of course, talks about other structural benefits of a robust party system, such as policy packaging, because usually parties, when they contest elections or when they seek to influence voters, will put together a package of policies rather than being single issue parties, which don't really last for too long. And then, of course, there is a, a sort of extension of that argument to the idea of ally prediction that once you have a stable political party, which has a reputation over time, then it also becomes possible for competitors, voters and others to, uh, to, to frame what kind of alliances this party may engage with either in voting behavior or even in terms of electoral alliances. So the second frame of the paper is, of course, working with these qualities. Uh, which, uh, according to the author, a constitutional, a liberal democratic constitution should try to create. And then, of course, he proceeds to four qualities which he thinks can be pursued uh, in terms of creating a robust framework for political parties. Uh, he offers the important clarification that rather than doing this through formal constitutional changes, such as amendments uh, or big ticket judicial decisions, such changes can also happen through amendments, to, through statutes, and also through ordinary administrative and judicial interpretation. So here he talks about four qualities which a particular constitutional text should try to create uh, in terms of enabling robust party competition and a meaningful formulation of the political party system. Uh, he talks about the idea of purposive party autonomy, that ordinarily there should be freedoms to organize politically, to put forward certain viewpoints through the political spectrum. And unless, of course, you have very strong anti-democratic positions or harmful positions, by and large, there should be an emphasis on allowing a diversity of political views to prevail. Uh, and the constitutional system should also not place undue barriers on the formation and recognition of political parties. Then that idea is carried forward to the second quality, which is described as party system optimality, which is, I think, in, a simpler, uh, in simpler words, is that most voter preferences that exist in a political unit should be represented in a party system. And in that sense, there is an inherent respect for plurality in the way in which we design law and regulation around political parties. Uh, third is, of course, the older assumption of the party state separation, uh, which is necessary to ensure fair electoral competition. And generally, we try to separate the party from the state through a, a range of institutional mechanisms, such as protections for the political opposition, uh, assumptions of neutrality, which is, of course, a myth, but assumptions of neutrality for the administrative branch vis-a-vis -vis the ruling party, and a series of protections in election law and, uh, and public law, which is meant to separate uh, the entity of, called the political party, which may be in power from the state machinery. And lastly, of course, he talks about uh, the anti-faction principle, where he says that there might be some positions within political parties that may make the overall view of a particular political party very incoherent, or may lead to further instability in the way in which parties perform their intermediating functions, and they can be legal measures or countermeasures to act against those factions. Especially, he, I think the main, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood that segment properly, so I'll seek that clarification. But I thought the understanding of the anti-faction principle was more of a uh, tap of, uh, tip of the hat to the current political scenario, where you see uh, factions within political parties being increasingly dominant in terms of either being aligned to capital interests or perhaps to extremist agendas and, and undermining the larger goal of a political party, which is to aggregate opinion and to represent a broad church uh, as the author says. So maybe I'm not, I think I may not have understood that uh, point very carefully. So I'll, I'll push forward and ask a question about it. And the third frame, of course, is about voting systems, which is something that I think our audience would be very familiar with, which is the classical debate about uh, the first past the post system having certain structural harms. And what are the alternative voting systems that could be thought about or considered to undo some of the, uh, some of the problems with first past the post system? So especially over the last 20 years, you have NGOs in India, especially ADR, uh, run by Professor Anil Sarwal, amongst others, who have constantly argued that the FPTP system that we have had under the representation of People Act 1951 uh, essentially creates manufactured majorities, because in order to capture power, you don't need a decisive share of voters in a particular constituency. You only need to win a few more seat, uh, votes than your competitors. So especially in a multi-party system, where there might be four or five strong parties competing for, for votes, especially where voting preferences may be strongly aligned with caste or religion, it is quite likely that a party which is able to mobilize a middling majority 
or even a marginal majority may end up capturing power. And through strategic use of the first past the post system, which I think the current ruling party is doing very well uh, in states like UP, of course, for not for reasons that many of us may agree with, but at least they've understood the working of the system. And, and by appealing to both upper caste and OBC votes, they have outwitted their competitors such as the SP and the BSP, uh, which are still largely sectional parties and have not been able to compete with the BJP uh, in, in, in Uttar Pradesh, at least in these recent electoral cycles. So I think that's a concrete example of the harms of FPTP, where you might have a substantial Dalit or Muslim population in the state of Uttar Pradesh, but in terms of formal representation in the legislature, they hardly get any seats because of the electoral system that we have. Of course, this criticism can be scaled up to the national level to even talk about the disparity in the number of seats that the BJP is getting vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. And of course, there are proposals for alternative models of voting, such as proportional representation, where you might take a particular state or you might take the a particular country as a unit of analysis and assign parliamentary seats based on vote shares rather than territorial constituency. So that's, of course, an older debate, which I think all of you have looked at in your political science courses, and we will definitely discuss that uh, in the constitutional law course as well later this year. But I think Tarunov's analysis is in a way going past that older debate. And his main formulation is that uh, when we look at parliamentary representation or the legitimacy of electoral representation, it's obviously time to think past FPTP. And in his prescriptive model, which I just outlined, he does talk about methods such as preferential voting and proportional representation for the model that he outlines. So that I think uh, hopefully covers the main frame uh, that the author is working with. Uh, but now let's come to the central argument or the prescription that comes uh, over the course of the paper. Uh, according to him, one of the central problems, uh, and I think uh, other scholars such as Arendt Lippert in the past were also struggling with this question. Uh, but a, a structural question in political theory, of course, is that when you design electoral systems, how do you manage this trade-off between accountability and effectiveness? And in some cases, of course, there is a direct trade-off between electoral accountability and representation of interests uh, at, at the same time, uh, or sexual interests at the same time, I beg your pardon. So Tarunab's formulation is fairly straightforward. I think it's put out in a very logical frame uh, that we can work with the existing bicameral structures that most nations have, but just with some tweaks to the way in which these chambers are composed and the kind of functions we attribute to them. So, so he says that in a, in a bicameral legislature, you ought to, of, of course, have one chamber which can be described as the confidence and opposition chamber, which simply means that uh, any uh, the party or coalition that needs to capture power needs to have a majority in this confidence and opposition chamber. But rather than using first past the post, his argument is that there should be methods involving preferential voting, which are more suited uh, for electing this chamber. He suggests that there should be shorter terms uh, for, for this particular chamber so that governance becomes more accountable to voters at large so that unpopular policy choices or harmful policy choices can be quickly punished uh, in the frequent electoral cycles. And most importantly, this would be a forum which over time would become the main forum for parties which are focused on capturing power and focused on governing. Then the second chamber, which he describes as the checking and appointment chamber, uh, would be slightly different from our current imagination of bicameralism. And I'll explain that point before I pose my questions. The checking and appointment chamber, according to him, would formally have the same uh, 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 legislative pedigree as the second first chamber, uh, but would be chosen through proportional representation, which could be based on the state or the nation as the political unit, which would ensure a better proportionality between the existence of certain interest groups and their representation in parliament. So uh, this forum would, uh, would have longer terms for the legislators, and their main job would be to ask questions of the incumbent executive and to hold the executive accountable because most of the parties who are likely to enter the second chamber through proportional representation are more likely to represent smaller sectional interests. Uh, hypothetically, if you were to apply this in the Indian context, it would be like a Rajya Sabha where you had proportional representation rather than representation of states, which again has become quite ineffective. But if you were to have hypothetically a Rajya Sabha with, let's say, uh, uh, re representation for smaller parties based on proportional representation, you might see more of a voice for interest groups that otherwise go unrecognized or otherwise get pushed aside in, in single party dominated parliaments or in coalitional parties where a few players are more significant. So those are a couple of structural tweaks that he suggests to the existing bicameral model. And then he talks about the distinctive roles that these chambers need to play in terms of both enabling the exercise of, of government and also checking the role of government 
over a longer period of time. So as I understood, uh, this theoretical formulation is building upon the older literature on bicameralism, uh, but I saw that it was directly speaking to Professor Ackerman's analysis on constrained parliamentarianism. And in terms of adding uh, knowledge uh, to this field, I thought this attempt uh, is, of course, an attempt to reframe the debate on bicameral structures and the way in which we look at uh, the field of doctrinal constitutional law. Uh, but now let me just conclude with a few questions which I hope Saruna will be able to answer uh, in the course of our session. So I think the first question I've already flagged uh, to some extent uh, that uh, when you, uh, in terms of just the methodology of the paper, uh, you seem to be focused more on the assumptions of what the legislature can do in terms of representing the interests of people. Uh, but I don't see you giving too much time and attention to the other claims that Professor Ackerman makes uh, about the role of specialized institutions uh, in, in reflecting expertise in government or the counter majoritarian role of courts in other institutions. So I know there are stray observations that you've made in different parts of your paper where you're concentrating on the, on the political process as the main sort of forum for resolving political disagreements. But I personally felt that maybe you could have also engaged with that idea and explained to your reader why you think that's not so significant. Uh, because if the paper has to be read by audiences across age groups, across different levels of exposure to the discipline, it wasn't so clear why that level of clarification was not there. Uh, and most of my questions, as you might expect, uh, are actually based on a sort of presumption of what would happen with such a model in Indian, Indian politics. I know that in your paper, you have clarified that this is more of a normative model and you don't obviously, I mean, you're not making an argument that is spe specifically tailored to different countries. I think that clarification is there in your introduction. But since you are rooted in the scholarship in Indian constitutional law, and so are we, uh, I can't help you help but think about some of the implications of the model that you have proposed vis-a-vis -vis some current issues in Indian politics. So one, of course, is the role of the Rajya Sabha. We know that uh, in the framing of the constitution, the Rajya Sabha was broadly given two functions. One was the federalist function in terms of it becoming a council of states, because prior to independence, it was more the Rajya Sabha, which is the council of princes. So from a chamber representing the princely states, it, 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 it was the second forum, the second chamber of the parliament became a council of states. But we know that in practice, that idea of representation of states has not been effectively pursued. And even the courts have diluted the criteria for getting elected to the Rajya Sabha, where parties can essentially park retired politicians or people who they need to be in parliament but did not get directly elected. So we know that there has been a structural undermining of the Rajya Sabha's federalist function. But how do you compare the federalist function, uh, which was attributed to the design of the Rajya Sabha, with, let's say, your policy prescription of moving towards proportional representation, where you would feel that the second chamber can act as a stronger check on the government of the day, especially in terms of giving voice to smaller parties and smaller interest groups, which are never likely to, which are not likely to enter government anytime. So that's, I think, my first question. The second question is the debate uh, in the debate around first past the post, where obviously we are seeing the problems of first past the post in a very enhanced way these days, uh, especially in Indian electoral politics, where we have a deeply fractured opposition, which is why uh, we have people now calling for opposition unity as the only effective strategy for tackling the current ruling party. But in the longer run, uh, would proportional representation help us in solving this problem of this further fragmentation? And further, uh, uh, for further differentiation in the electoral opposition, or would you, or or or, would, or, or instead of actually consolidating their, their their positions, we might actually see that the implementation of a PR system might actually further lead to marginalization in a context like India. So I'm specifically thinking about Muslim and Dalit representation uh, in the Indian Parliament at the moment. Uh, we know that if you just take a look around and take a view of current Indian politics, there are about four parties that explicitly identify themselves as Dalit parties and have some representation uh, in a few state legislatures. Uh, the BSP, of course, in UP, the LJP in Bihar, uh, the RPI in Maharashtra. Of course, there is a splinter group now, which has gone to the other side. And there is the VCK in Tamil Nadu. Now, the structural problems of NPTP badly affect the growth of these parties, because even though they might have a significant vote share uh, in certain constituencies, the design of our electoral system makes it very hard for them to get a sizable number of MLAs or MPs elected to parliament. In fact, in Hyderabad itself, you have the most uh, publicly discussed case of Mr. Rovesi, uh, who is often described as a vote cutter by other secularist parties when he contests elections in other states. So 
can we carefully think through the implications of adopting something akin to a proportional representation model in an electoral framework like ours, where uh, in any case, the marginalized sections are finding it very hard to organize themselves polit politically and enter parliament or state legislatures. And what would be the necessary consequence of proportional representation, I think, should not be a foregone conclusion. Uh, for instance, it's quite likely that even if you consolidate votes at the state level or the central level, these parties may st still struggle to compete electorally or even be parties of influence, as you have framed it. Similarly, a, a, a deeper crisis exists with Muslim representation today. Uh, there's only the AIMIM in Hyderabad, which has some organizational capital in terms of influencing the media. But the AIUDF in Assam or the uh, IUML in Kerala are both struggling, both organizationally and, and financially. So I'm just wondering whether the shift towards proportional representation or even the normative model that you have suggested might, let's say, strengthen the role of such parties as parties of influence uh, in the future. And the last question, of course, that I had was that uh, one thread which I found maybe in the third part of the paper where you speak about other coordination mechanisms and other mechanisms that can be used to strengthen parliamentary democracy. So you refer to examples such as coalition cabinets, uh, committees that can be created uh, for further coordination between the legislatures. So I wasn't quite clear about how there are improvements upon the existing systems. So for instance, we know that a coalition cabinet uh, largely works akin to the consociational model, which uh, uh, Professor Liphart had framed uh, 50 years ago. Of course, a lot of people don't agree with the use of consociationalism in India because they argue that using the term consociationalism seems to reflect a narrow emphasis on keeping the peace or stability and the cost of democratic representation. But we had that famous debate between Steve Wilkinson and Arendt Liphart about 25 years ago on whether consociationalism is still a relevant theory to understand Indian electoral democracy. And I'm just wondering whether it was worth engaging with that with a bit more depth, uh, even if you weren't focusing your examples, I mean, focusing your theory on a particular set of examples, I was just wondering whether uh, that was an idea which you wanted to work through in, in this paper. Uh, and I think uh, this the one last bit I had was about the uh, role of parliamentary standing committees, which of course at one point were being projected as a mechanism that could allow for uh, let's say uh, cooperation between the government and opposition, especially when it comes to lawmaking and also drawing in expertise from the private sector. Uh, but we are, of course, seeing a whole scale neglect of standing committees and a whole scale neglect of established legislative processes, especially in the second term of NDA. So that, of course, is a larger problem of the uh, aggrandizement of the executive branch that you've spoken about elsewhere. But I'm, I'm wondering how you would account for such realities uh, when you're offering a policy prescription like this. Uh, because even a legislature that is chosen on proportional representation or on preferential voting with clearly demar demarcated functions uh, would not really be able to do much uh, if you have a very powerful executive that does not believe in established parliamentary processes. So I'm not sure whether uh, that, that issue could have been simply sidestepped and maybe it might have made more sense to deal with that directly uh, at some point in your paper. Uh, so I think yeah, so that's what I had managed to write down. Uh, I mean, there were quite a few other things, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I, I'll limit myself to that. Should I respond to them before the turn by now, or how do you want to do this? Do you want to add to Siddharth's questions? Uh, no, I, I think that's enough to start with. Professor Chauhan has really laid the groundwork pretty well for the Q&A. So uh, probably you could start with responding to them, and then we can take questions from the general audience in the chat box, and I'll be moderating those and ask those individually. So I think we can start by responding to the questions by Professor Chai. I don't want to lose your questions, though, for now. So I hope that you can come back with yours as well after they have responded. Yes, I, I would. I would. I'll join in. Yes. Well, so that thanks very much. That was an extremely helpful summary, and I think uh, I feel vindicated in my stand of trying not to present my paper um, because you did a better job. <laughs> I would. It's always a pain to present your own paper anyway. So, so I'll just deal with your questions uh, one by one. Thanks for these very sharp and helpful questions. Not provoking. I think your reading of the paper is, uh, is quite spot on. So I'm not going to um, challenge any of those, except perhaps phase out in one of my responses, the idea of preferential voting a little bit. But let me start with why I don't talk about uh, regulatory institutions of courts here. 
So one reason I don't talk about quotes um, is that I'm sick of quotes. I just think that quotes that so much of constitutional scholarship has spent so much time thinking about quotes exclusively to the exclusion of all other constitutional actors. I just think that you know the opportunity cost of giving even more airtime to quotes is really damaging for all the other actors. So I've just, you know, I think where my scholarship is growing, most of it is, you know, if there's a summarizing that I can do of it, it's not quotes, right? I think most things that one would want to say about quotes have probably been said. That's not true. But I just think that others have received so little attention that that's what I'm focusing on. Um, on uh, what is being called the fourth branch of guarantor institutions, I do have a separate paper uh, just accepted. I posted the link in the chat box. Uh, maybe we can have another <laughs> discussion at some point. About it. You know, as you can tell from the length of this paper, the journal was already getting a little bit too concerned about I'm sending them a book in form of an article. So, um, so that's in part the reason why this paper does not talk about expertise and county majority or anything. But the second reason why it does not is that unlike Professor Ackerman, I don't think that these um, aspects of constitutional design, which is sports and guarantor institutions, necessarily go hand in hand with particular models of legislative, executive, design, and so I think that we can have under majoritarian courts and guarantor institutions in presidential systems, in pure parliamentary systems, in semi-presidential systems, in semi-parliamentary systems. And of course, they will work differently. But I think that uh, they are in some ways independent, at least conceptually and normatively independent of the legislative executive relations that was my focus in this paper. So I know that, you know, he includes these autonomous electoral commissions as part of his uh, definition of constrained parliamentarism. I don't do that. That's not why my parliamentarism is moderated. It's moderated for internal features rather than moderated externally by institutions. And that is the point of departure between his analysis and mine. On your second question about Rajya Sabha, <clears throat> Representation of states, you're quite right that it has not been effectively pursued. I'm, I'm not, I'm not as uh, cynical about Rajya Sudhar's role in representing state-based parties, perhaps as you are as well as any state. I think that in the in the quasi-federal model that we started with, where states don't have in equal share in India, but a proportional share. Um, I think the Rajya Sabha has done reasonably well, uh, at least since the 80s, in, in giving votes to state parties. Um, the beauty of moderated parliamentarism is that it can accommodate all styles of horizontal separation of parties. It's compatible with a unitary form of government where the upper house will just have a single proportion of electorate in Israel. It's also compatible with uh, a, an equal federal system like in Australia where every state will be one constituency for proportional model, but there was an equal number of candidates to the upper class. And it's compatible with the Indian model of quasi, what's probably called quasi, where um, states don't send equal numbers uh, members, some version population based. Uh, so um, the, all that will 
differ is the unit or the number of constituencies. If so you were in a unitary system, the whole country will be one constituency. In a federal or quasi-federal system, each state will be one constituency. But you should see similar voice to two parties. I should say as an aside on that question and say. I think it's an intellectual and political ticking bomb in India, the upcoming 2026 delimitation exercise when the constitutional reforms are uh, census based intra interstate delimitation will expire. If the current government is in power, it has no incentive to extend the polls. And I don't think, well, I do think that the new parliament building is very much in preparation for expanding representation from the northern states um, to, to, to delimit interstate uh, seats uh, in accordance with, um, with population. Uh, so, so there is an interesting conversation in federalism to be had in about what we mean by state representation in sort of shared sovereignty and things like that, but that's for another day. On opposition unity to tackle the ruling party and the problem with the proportional representation. So this is where I want to draw attention to the preferential vote for the lower chamber, uh, which is a system that's not much understood or debated or discussed in India. It is, uh, it's, it's also called the right choice vote or the alternative vote. Under moderated parliamentarism, the lower house, the Lok Sabha, which is the confidence supplying chamber, will be elected on a preferential vote, ranked choice one, which basically um, is single member constituency based system, like first past the post. However, instead of voting for one individual candidate, Voters systems differ on how they organize banking, but voters are either allowed to or required to bank either a certain number or up to a certain number of all the candidates on the ballot. Obviously, in India, ranking all the candidates and 50 candidate ballot is impossible. So you can imagine when you go to the polling booth, you're allowed as a practical example a ballot that gives you three columns, column one, column two, column three, and then just you put a check next to your first preference candidate, your second preference candidate, and your third preference candidate. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I am attracted to the preferential model for the confidence chamber is precisely that it does not fragment the, the confidence chamber. So smaller parties will still lose out, just as they lose out on the first pass the post. So take your example, Oasis Party. How will that fare, just thinking aloud, under moderated parliament? And under my system, under the preferential system for the Lord, Oasis Party is not likely to win any sense. However, and this difference is key from first past the post. It will it will allow his party to enter into pre-electoral deals with larger parties of governments, which are more likely to win power. To say, I will advise my voters. Always he can tell, say, a party like Congress, I will advise my voters to vote for the Congress as their second choice if you give 5% tickets or 10% tickets to Muslim candidates. So this kind of pre-electoral deals are extremely common in preferential systems. Smaller parties, especially Greens, for example, who know they will not win seats in a confidence chamber can still extract policy concessions. And these concessions take place before the election, so voters don't feel cheated. They know exactly what's on offer, right? And uh, so it's unlike the NCP Shiv Sena, that Bandhan in Maharashtra after the poll, which might leave voters cheated. So it allows for greater voter choice, 
Also, um, the ranking allows for greater voter choice because in a ranked system, a very divisive party, let's say the BJP, is likely to be your first choice or your last choice. So parties which are very divisive tend not to be your anybody's number two choice, right? And therefore, the preferential voting system forces parties to speak to a broad church. So you can't get 32% and form government. You will have to broaden your horizons. And the smaller parties have to work with bigger parties. So it's actually better for coalition building. But these are ideological and natural coalitions. Right? The difference is in the upper chamber. Only the upper chamber is proportional. That is where Oasis Party will get some seats. And therefore, an influence in, in legislation. And I'll talk about that in response to your final which is coordination committees and how is that an improvement on the By the way, I don't recommend coalition cabinets, uh, or at least coalition cabinets um, sort of across the ideological spectrum. Uh, they may be necessary in a country like India, but uh, the entire point, one of the point of requiring um, the ranked choice system, which is still a majoritarian system in the confidence chamber, is that it benefits or over advantages larger parties like the Congress and the BJP, just as first past the post does, at the cost of smaller parties like the Bahujan Singh Party or, or Oasis Party, right? So that will continue to happen. It's just that it forces the larger parties to speak to a broader population and it forces larger parties to make deals with smaller parties, right? So I'm not recommending coalition. Pro Cabinets necessarily because uh, governments are likely to still be centered on one single large party, even if that party does not have a simple majority on its own terms. The Congress or the BJP, or if you know, an F party or Aam Aadmi party becomes a large party of governance, uh, governments were executive will still be centered around one party and several little satellite parties. That will not change. The coordination committee is for coordinating between the two legislative houses. The different electoral models, the ranked choice system for the lower house and the proportional system for the upper house, combined with different uh, electoral schedules and staggered, staggered elections and all of that other stuff that's in the paper, is designed to ensure that the same party is not likely to have a majority in both houses. Uh, in fact, it's designed to come close to the idea that no party is ever likely to have a majority in the upper house, right? And because both parties, while only the lower house can fire the government, the lower house supplies confidence and fires and fires the government. But legislatively, both houses are equal. They have equal legislative power, which means that the ruling party in the lower house cannot legislate alone. However, it also means, unlike the American system, where it's a two-party system because they don't have a proportional system. If you if you allow proportional voting, you will automatically have multiple parties, right? Proportional voting is not likely to see a two-party system. In a two-party system, the opposition has, the single opposition party has no incentive to work with the government. Right? So when the presidency and Congress are in different parties control under the American system, you have a deadline. Right? Nothing happens. No legislation gets announced. In under my system, <clears throat> while the ruling party cannot function alone, the opposition, because it's divided in multiple parties, can exercise a veto only if it acts united. So on every issue, the government, the ruling party can get its law, its bill enacted, but it has to convince three or four or five, depending on the numbers, smaller opposition parties. Right? So it requires some consensus, but not across the board political consensus. So it's, that's why it's moderated. And that's the optimization of effectiveness. We don't want governance and legislation to stop, but also constrain, because we do want the government to have to do some dealing with the opposition and should not be able to completely ignore the opposition that the current system of joint sitting 
be in case the two houses basically are ours, but now even that's not necessary because the upper house also uh, I, has a near majority. Uh, there, there's a lot else that needs to change in India. Uh, you know, the money bill is showing the drama. Anyway, I'll shut up there. More questions. Yeah, Ashish, you're on mute. Yeah, Ashish, you're on mute. I just had one point of clarification. Maybe I hurried through that point. So uh, I was not attributing the coalition cabinets or uh, was the standing committee examples to you. I was just trying to think through how the sort of those mechanisms square up against your models. But I think you clarified that. Yeah, I, I just a quick um, follow up on that. I just don't think that uh, constitutionally forced shared executives is workable, not in Indian condition. I just do not think that a government which has a finance minister from the BJP and the home minister from a Congress uh, will be a coherent government that can function effectively. I think uh, it will just, you know, seek to destroy itself. Thank you so much for that, Professor Khaitan. Uh, I think we have some questions from the audience also begin to come in now. Um, but I, I just want to uh, ask you one question and then I won't stand in the way between you and the audience. Uh, and that's, uh, I know it's not directly related to the structure of the proposed moderated parliament, um, but more so revolving around the imagination of an activist court and uh, whether that imagination is legitimately diminished uh, when we have assuming the best case scenario of a moderated parliamentary system working in place, because then we enhance the checks and balances intra-parliament. Uh, so do we want to then justifiably say that the courts should be more deferential uh, when they deal with the legislative output of a body like that? Assuming it is working to its fullest potential uh, in the best case scenario. Okay, thanks, Prana, for this question. Um, <clears throat> so, to the extent that politics is dysfunctional, I say that in quotes, right? Not my view. I think that politicians get very bad press in probably and fairly so. They have an extremely tough job in one of the biggest disservice that the media does is this lazy journalistic claim that they're all crooks. Need to distinguish between the good and the bad. But anyway, that's putting that to one side. Um, so most middle class rhetoric of they're all crooks, so they don't function, has allowed at least discursively uh, a legitimation of the court's uh, Norms power. So I do think that at least to the extent that that power will become less available to them uh, under this model, um, I think it is a trap. Uh, you know, you have to deal with issues like disruption. The main cause of disruption is that the opposition has uh, no agenda control in India. And I think, so I'm working on a paper on opposition rights as well. And, you know, you have to have at least one day a week, which is the opposition day where the opposition gets to schedule the debate, the motions, the bills, you know, uh, it's, we spend so much time worrying about the counter-majority identity of the power of unelected courts. We spend no time at all worrying about giving no power at all to elected representatives of the people who represent vast, vast swathes of the country, right? So, so I think um, uh, at least, at least one day in the week, that's where the agenda is controlled by parliament, by the opposition. The government cannot say they're not going to discuss uh, Pegasus, for example. It's, it's part of the solution. But uh, coming most uh, one other dimension I do want to point out is that I, I think the Indian court's description as an activist court is needs to be qualified. It's an idiosyncratic court, it's an eccentric court. It is activist and it's highly deferential. It's highly activist in its in the scope of its jurisdiction, the scope of rights, which obviously granted jurisdiction. It's extremely deferential on many things like standard of review. Right? Things where it actually should be, this is obviously a broad comment in many exceptions. 
but uh, on so many matters of critical importance, especially civil and political liberties. The court has exercised an appallingly deferential standard of review, which should which it should be ashamed of. So I think you know we also need to nuance this characterization that the court is highly activist. Thank you so much for that. So uh, we have a question from uh, Ritika, who's asking, and I think very relevant to the Indian context, uh, would moderated parliamentarianism be able to prevent influences of politicians with a personality cult? No, it can't prevent it. No, no system of design can prevent it. Some institutional design models uh, make it more attractive to politicians than others, uh, and others make it less attractive. Moderated parliamentarism is definitely designed to make it less attractive. Uh, if you can imagine all the possibilities of, you know, pure presidentialism, the two forms of semi-presidentialism, pure parliamentarism, semi-parliamentarism, all forms of executive legislative relations, I think presidentialism obviously is the one that uh, ha gives the strongest incentive to a personality. Moderated parliamentarism is very much premised on the value of political parties. It's premised on the idea that political parties are hugely important, in fact, indispensable for democracy. And, and some of the things that I've described especially with the preferential voting system, uh, where the smaller parties can influence the larger parties on policy by using the power of recommending their second vote to the voters. I think it, it forces the electoral conversation to at least some issues of policy, and therefore it distracts, hopefully, from personal but you know these are not things that design can solve. Design is like a catalyst. It can uh, it's either a negative catalyst. It, it can slow down certain political reactions, or a positive catalyst. It can accelerate certain political reactions. It can't stop something that's going to happen necessarily. It can't make something happen that's just not going to happen. Thank you so much for that. Um, so next question is coming from Ankush, uh, and and Ankush asking that uh, how would moderated parliamentarianism prevent two specific situations that hamper accountability and effective governance, uh, specifically so in Indian democracy. Uh, one of which he says is political funding through large corporates, and he cites the Finance Act 2017 and the criminalization of Indian politics. And uh, how would the system? try to ameliorate the effects on electoral democracy of these developments? So, moderate parliamentarism cannot solve all problems with Indian politics. And these are both extremely difficult problems that need their own solutions. Um, on the funding model, one of the things moderated parliamentarism might be able to, if it was in place, if an, any funding, any political funding model that only benefits the large parties would be relatively difficult to get enacted in the moderated parliament because of the equal legislative voice of the upper, upper chamber. Now, of course, it may well be that the two largest parties join hands in forcing a bill through, but if all the smaller parties are united in their opposition to the to large parties, there might be a political case to be, uh, especially in uh, in preferential being. So, so certain types of lawmaking which is self dealing. Basically, this is what this is an example of self dealing or gaming the system where the parties skew the electoral field in their own favor. This is precisely the kind of issue where. Connecting to Sadat's first question, both counter majoritarian institutions and guarantor institutions uh, have an important role. Both the Electoral Commission and the Supreme Court um, have a role in ensuring that uh, this kind of self dealing is 
the string or this in both ways. On, on criminalization of politics, I just want to say that, again, this is a debate that, you know, very much like the all politicians of truth debate, lacks nuance. Um, our judiciary and our middle classes really love this idea of decriminalizing politics. But we need to ask, what is the time? Uh, a lot of these politicians are booked under public order crimes that in India is simply a part of being a politician. Uh, it should not be that. You know, politics in street protests and assembly should not invite criminalization. But we need to know what crimes they are charged with. And also, there are implications with presumptions of innocence. Uh, whether there has been conviction or merely a charge and, uh, is an appeal pending. So, all of those issues remain, and I'm not dismissing uh, the problem. Obviously, with conviction, uh, there are legal disabilities that and they post on a certain period of time when you're barred from public office. And I think that it's justified and legitimate uh, in a democracy. Part of the problem obviously is our criminal justice system that uh, takes forever, probably usually more than a lifetime to come to a, uh, a, a, a final judgment on, on conviction. And criminal. Uh, thank you, Professor Ketan. Uh, uh, if I can just request you, uh, if it's possible, to be a bit closer to your mic, because uh, in, in some instances, the voice is sort of fading away. Uh, sure. Thank you so much uh, for that nuanced response to Ankush's question. Uh, the other one uh, we have is from Jay, and Jay is asking whether the moderated parliamentarianism system entail a value judgment on post-poll coalitions. Uh, as they may often be seen as subverting democratic mandate, especially when they exclude the yes. single largest party, uh, like it happened as we were discussing in uh, Maharashtra, and whether that's specifically compatible with the party optimality principle. Um, so, moderated parliamentarism does not prohibit post poll coalitions. And, however, unlike a system where the confidence chamber is elected through a proportional system, post poll coalitions are almost inevitable. If you have the Lok Sabha elected by a proportional model, uh, you will have to have post poll coalitions in almost certain in a country like India, especially. Um, it's not a system that is avoided, uh, where it's made less likely in moderated parliamentarism. Uh, and largely because post poll coalition. So I'm not so worried about the democratic post poll coalition. I think that um, politicians should be allowed to change their minds, to make compromises, to, to go back on promises. These are all things that a, a healthy democratic politics uh, requires people to do. And if you don't change your mind, that's actually more, more dangerous for democracy than, than when you do. Uh, the problem with some types of post poll coalitions is effectiveness. This is when uh, post poll coalitions involve parties that are uh, ideologically very strange bedfellows um, and governmental effectiveness suffers. It may be very good for politics to sometimes have uh, ideologically uh, very Part apart parties in coalition with each other and learn to live with each other and understand the other viewpoint. But that will be that will be less uh, likely to be required under the monetary parliament system. But it's by no means ruled out. All that it does is that it requires at least some parties to form informal pre-poll coalitions with the larger parties, but it forces parties to put their cards on the table about which are their ideological sort of hamrahis and which parties um, they're not going to have a deal with. And also toxic parties uh, are also easy to identify. Toxic parties uh, 
with whom everybody refuses to deal, like the uh, One Nation Party in Australia. No mainstream party um, does a deal with them because they are just so racist. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, any other questions? Please feel free to uh, type it out in the chat box. Um, meanwhile, I, I just have a more uh, a follow up and, and an example to the question Jay was asking, which is in terms of the 10th schedule in the Indian constitution uh, and whether a moderated parliamentary system would take a more liberal view of quote defections and quote as such in keeping in line with the principle that they can change their mind and um, they should be truly representing their electoral constituencies in changing that mind. So, um, I, while politicians can and should be flexible in their policy commitments, moderated parliamentarism takes parties very seriously and believes that a healthy democracy needs healthy parties. To the extent that the tense schedule, if its design is improved, can reduce the role of money in it, I think it's a good thing. There are design flaws in the tense schedule. Um, and to my mind, uh, there are two main design flaws. One is the is the one third, the split versus defection distinction which incentivizes a broader split within the party um, uh, and therefore allows uh, legislators to be bought and so I think it's entirely uh, legitimate to require constitutionally that if you were elected on a party's ticket and you choose to resign from that party, you need to stand for election. But that seat, uh, you, when you leave the party, you also leave the seat. And I think it's a it's an understanding of the representative function uh, as shared between the legislator and her party. Right? We we focus too much on just the legislator and ignore the role that party does in securing votes for the legislator. The second flow to my mind in the 10th schedule is that it requires uh, legislators to, to, to toe the party line on all votes. And I think that uh, that should be limited to confidence in confidence votes. Yeah. Every single legislator. So you make a distinction between party membership and policy choices. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so the next question is from Padmasri, and uh, she's asking how does the bicameralism of the moderated parliamentarianism system align with federalism in parliamentary structures? Does it account for a house of states and is the checking and appointments chamber going to necessarily be that um, house? I think I've answered this question in yeah. response to that, which is that the upper house can indeed be designed as a federal chamber. All you need is constituencies that are the size of each state rather than of the entire country. Okay. Uh, and Mitaksha is asking, how does the parties as intermediaries imagination check the populist check. tendencies of legislatures where constitutional or legal principle might be at odds with the popular opinion? Uh, and the example being given is of the lowering of the age of criminalization of juveniles post Nirbhaya and the chances of having knee jerk legislative responses to respond to popular opinion. And so, parliament may sometimes enact a constitutionally suspect law by giving in to public pressure. So, um, to the extent that the ruling party cannot pass legislation on its own, moderated parliamentarism forces some deliberation before legislation, which um, hopefully uh, is some check on, uh, on populism. Um, 
But again, I repeat my previous answer that this is not a panacea for everything that ails India. Um, there will be there will be other things that need doing, and I think um, a a public discourse that is that is not fueled by twenty four seven corporate media is one of them. You know, there is a paper that hopefully I will write at some point, uh, or even better, somebody else will write before me on on why for-profit news media should be constitutionally unacceptable, that, that news media must, and universities, must be organized along not-for-profit or charity or uh, political lines, uh, because they have, they're so important for democracy and they have an important truth-telling function when that, when the profit making motive gets in the way of truth telling function of media and, and the academy, I think democracy becomes uh, in danger. So, so there are other things that we need to think about and become open to thinking. Thank you. That's a fascinating response. Um, Jaskaran has uh, sent in the next question. Um, and I think in some parts we've been dealing with this issue, but he's asking, uh, how does the proposal autonomy principle check horse trading, poaching of MLAs, et cetera, between different political parties? Uh, and if I'm to elaborate the concern where he's coming from is if the paper says that uh, the purpose that should be enabled by the scheme is that the parties compete to have a share in political power. Uh, do we want to draw a distinction between a share in participation at the electoral stage or post poll poaching of MLAs, et cetera? And I think Jaskaran wants to know specifically this in context of the purpose of autonomy principle. Sure. So the purpose of autonomy principle um, wants to make parties autonomous and wants to make parties healthy and robust and autonomous in order to allow them to secure their purpose of securing a share in state power, but obviously legitimate, right? not illegitimate. So, um, so there are two uh, or three things that that this paper has on the question of horse trading. Purposive autonomy principle requires the law to kind of stay out of how parties discipline their own members. And I think there is a disturbing and increasing tendency on and misguided tendency, especially driven by thoughts and middle class majority my mindset on hatred of politicians. You know, where all manner of public law norms and public law duties are imposed upon parties in terms of how they deal with internal discipline, that South Africa has required its political parties to follow all the natural justice processes that the state of institutions have to follow. I don't think that's right. I think parties should be allowed to make this decision with an eye, not just on law, but on politics. Uh, we, we eviscerate parties' political character when, when we impose too much law. Uh, in their internal functioning. I think this is the same reason why I think requiring parties to be internally democratic by law is a terrible idea. And look what it did to the Republican, Republican Party in the US. Part of the reason why the Republican Party has become this crazy right, ultra right wing Trump party is because of its internal democratization. So I'm, um, I'm very much against sort of law controlling parties, including how some restraints, which I've mentioned in the paper. So this is not a free hand. Uh, the autonomy is still purposing. And combined with this, obviously I've just mentioned that I, I think it's entirely legitimate for MLAs and MPs to lose their uh, seat if they vote against the party line on a confidence motion. And this should be respective of 
whether it's a one third split or a mere defection or whether they formally demand the party or whatever. If you vote again, if you leave the party or you vote against it on a confidence motion, you should see the people again with your new party affiliation. Uh, any more questions from anyone? You can type it out in the uh, chat box. Uh, okay, uh, we have one coming in from Abhinand, uh, who is asking how do the assumptions in an MP system fare well with intra-party democracy and the specific example being given for intra-party discipline is the multiple voting down of a no-deal Brexit in the Commons, arguably showing that party indiscipline is better in some cases. Uh, so if that's something you would like to respond to. Um, so if, as I just said, I, I don't like the law insisting on in a party democracy. I think it is for parties to decide how they want to run themselves. If they want to have a more bottom-up approach, that should be up to the party itself to adopt it and sell it as a point of distinction to the voters rather than, so what voters get is the package deal, but you, we can't, we should not, the law should not impose these ideas on parties. Is party indiscipline a good thing or a bad thing? It depends, well, in particular cases, it depends on what is the issue at hand, but more generally, uh, to the extent that moderated parliamentarism is a parliamentary system, no prime minister can afford to lose a bulk of the backbencher then. So, unlike a presidential system where presidents, because of the security of tenure, because the legislature cannot fire the president, which also, by the way, means that the president's own party cannot fire the president. The president can ignore any internal dissent within the party. To the extent that moderated parliamentarism is a parliamentary system, no prime minister can completely ignore uh, dissensions within the party. A prime minister has to take the party, the bulk of the party, and that is an internal check on prime minister. The prime minister's position is always insecure. She can be fired at any point by the ruling party itself. So that is an internal check that um, that is enforced politically, but then motivated, not legally. So. Um, so party indiscipline, once it reaches a particular um, level, uh, the Brexit issue was a very unique set of circumstances. It's not likely to repeat itself. It was unique because the backbenchers rebelled against the leadership, against Boris Johnson's leadership, but they were not willing to bring down the government. That's why you had an impasse. That's not very likely to happen. Usually, when you have that level of rebellion against uh, the executive leadership, uh, the party replaces the state. So the Brexit issue was highly eccentric, and I don't think six men Certainly, certainly. And I think. Uh... The example of voting down no deal Brexit is also answering that question and the response you were just giving that the prime minister will have to ultimately uh, relent and ultimately the prime minister had to go ahead uh, in the Brexit with some sort of a deal. But, even only, after, initial intention. but only after the elections. Right. So, right. so, you know, somebody has to blink, right? When, when the prime minister cannot get anything done, Either the party has to fire the prime minister or the prime minister has to resign. Because uh, under parliamentary systems, it can be very damaging for a government to be seen to be doing nothing. 
right? The president can blame it on the system that the opposition is not letting me function. A prime minister does not have that excuse because you have the house with you. So get out of the way if you cannot get things done, which is why the effectiveness dimension is stronger in parliament. And it was indeed a unique situation. I mean, you had a speaker who was willing to interpret the standing orders uh, creatively and give the opposition that space to take control of the agenda of the time of the House. Uh, something that we say we want, uh, at least when you were saying, at least have a day where the opposition can set the agenda. Uh, so yeah, and that, thank you very much for that. Was a day where the deputy speaker, who must be the opposition candidate, constitutionally protected opposition candidate, the signs, right? So these are innovations that we can think about in our constitutional context. If I may just quote uh, an extract from your paper. So it will, um, from page 148, it is regarding the identity, right, non identitarian politics. So it will require parties seeking to help the vulnerable sections to organize themselves on non identitarian basis or multi identitarian basis if they have to win elections. Uh, later on, it says that such dis uh, we should not be too concerned about uh, such disadvantaged groups because they would they should be a part of the broad church built by centrist parties. At any rate, centrist parties are li uh, likely to be less hostile ideologically to inclusive parties and so forth. So, but my question here is that there is an implicit assumption that the centrist party would come to their aid as opposed to an exclusionary faction. But we can assume the other way around as well, that they would be as indifferent. Let's say the disadvantaged group, uh, <clears throat> disadvantaged group or a smaller group or subgroup, they do not have the considerable numerical influence. So they would have to tone their pitch to suit the centrist uh, faction or some uh, centrist political parties or the wider aspirations of some relevance to have a voice in this setup. So how do we reconcile this binary and between they have to tone it to the centrist parties or uh, of course not towards the exclusionary faction. Now flowing from this idea, if such smaller groups, uh, and I really uh, want you to uh, explain this part, if such smaller groups do form a political party, would it be a serious political party under the uh, party system optimality principle? And in this regard, can you please explain on the idea of a serious political party? Because if this pattern progresses, wouldn't there, uh, wouldn't we run a risk um, of, you know, of muddling the voices of some, it, it, some sort of everyone, even if it uh, broadly concerns the, um, the majority voter type, but successively the disadvantage or the marginalized sections, which have lesser numerical quantum, they will just, you know, uh, they will have to toe the line sort of thing. I don't know what Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, so, so here is thought in relation to small marginalized groups. Now, in a first past the post system, these groups have only two choices. Either they have to vote for the most amenable, or if you want to be pessimistic, the least hostile centrist party to them, or only if they are geographically concentrated, they can form a political party and that will be so there's a distinction between minority groups that are geographically dispersed and those that are geographically concentrated. Under a single member constituency system for the lower class. In sort of proportional system with very large constituencies, that difference does not matter too much. And come to that in a but that is why we have seen the emergence of regional parties in India, which are state parties because of the linguistic concentration of certain groups on linguistically divided states. Right? But a lot of these parties will never become pan-Indian parties. 
because first past the post does not allow them. They're concentrated in that region. How will that change and and a moderated parliament? First, the best case scenario, the minority group with disadvantage group is adequately catered to by a large broad church in its party. And it's happy with that catering, it works for it, that's fine. It's arguably the best case scenario. Then let's pick a more similar. A group that does not find it represented by any of the parties in the system. Party optimization principle demands that such a group should be represented. And if there is no party that is doing that, this group will eventually form its own party. Now, how will that play out in the lower house elections, in ranked choice votes or preferential it will be in the interest of at least one of the larger centrist parties, usually being the interest of at least one of the larger centrist parties, to make a deal with this minority party for its second choice votes. A large party will want to tell the small party, look, you know, your voters will obviously vote you for the first choice. Can you ask your voters to put us down as number two? And what would you like in return? Right. So instead of just hope and optimism, it brings the parties to a negotiating table where the smaller party can name its price. The second thing under my system will be that the smaller party, subject to the proportionality thresholds, will enter the upper house. It will have a small voice in the upper house where by building strategic coalitions with other smaller parties, it will sometimes be able to block certain legislation or demand certain amendments in certain legislation. So to answer your question about will such a party be a serious party, yes. The serious party tag is to basically exclude what are called joke parties. Parties, and it's a phenomenon very common in certain jurisdictions, less so in others, but parties that don't want to, you know, like the monster loony party in the UK. These are joke parties whose candidates wear certain uniforms, like a bucket on their heads. They, are, they don't want to win, they just run elections or the cakes or whatever it might be. So that's what, and sometimes when they do win, uh, they surprise themselves. That they so that's what I mean by serious party. But within serious parties, there's a further division between parties of governance. These are the parties that are only, that are the big parties in the lower house that alone are likely to form a government or B, the unifying pole of a coalition government and influence and given that democracy is in the ultimate analysis a game of numbers, a minority party will at best be an influence party, but a serious party. The good thing about moderated parliamentarism is that it does not completely exclude the voice of such a minority party, like first past the post. On the other hand, Unlike a proportional system, the proportional system gives a lot of uh, more influence to a minority party than moderated parties, right? because a minority party can get into coalitions more frequently in a proportional system. But the proportional system does not make a distinction between a small racist party or an anti-Muslim party, or an LGBTQ people party, or an anti-women's party, and a small party that is supporting a marginalized, like a Dalit party, or given the context, say, 
Muslim. But moderated parliamentarism makes a difference between those two types of small parties. Why, you may ask? It does so because in a proportional system, you know, a racist party and a pro-immigration party, say, in a European country, both get 10% of the votes. They will each get 10 seats in parliament. In moderated parliamentarism, because the second vote comes, because in the lower chamber ranking comes, one hopes that it will be more likely for a minority party standing for vulnerable disadvantaged groups to make pre-election deals, to transfer their second choice votes more easily to the larger than racist parties. Now, this is an assumption based on normal politics. Sometimes an entire country can go crazy. It's happened before in Nazi Germany. Arguably, it may be happening in India. That is not something designed to solve. If the numbers of crazies shall we say bigots, is too high, no amount of democratic designing is going to save that quality. Ultimately, you have to rely, if you want a democracy, on some sense and wisdom. Obviously, the other idea about not-for-profit news media may also help in achieving that system. But moderated parliamentarism makes it less likely. Questions. Uh coming in we are approaching yeah it is half past seven so i think we have a lot of food for thought and a lot to think so thank you very much professor khetan on behalf of the lecture series on behalf of nalsar uh, i express my gratitude to you you took out the time and this has been a very insightful discussion discussion on a very fascinating paper uh, so i think there's a lot to think about uh, and uh, we'll have the recording available on the YouTube channel as well. I'll share it with you when it's out. And I think it's going to be more food for thought for an even larger audience once it's uploaded. So thank you very much once again. Also, Pranav, I wanted to add that, that, that this uh, format of pre-read paper workshops is something that we should also consciously try and do internally. Yeah. Yeah, because I think uh, uh, the level of engagement uh, would definitely be far better if we try and adopt this model. We, we, we can't do it possibly with all speakers, or at least with some speakers who want to discuss their recent work. I think this is a far Absolutely. better way. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much for engaging with my work, both Pranav and Siddharth and all the participants. I'm very grateful to NASA for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Katha. Oh, thank you. Bye, everyone.